Hi, it's Mary Wagstaff. I wanted to share with you why your attempts at a new relationship to alcohol haven't worked. What I find is people fall into two categories. One is the do more category. They take action to avoid or even compensate for alcohol or the learning more category. Another free class, podcast, sober Instagram account, doing more research without actually applying any of the information in real time. Neither of these methods are efficient, but I have great news. I have the silver bullet and it's called the five shifts. It is a process to find freedom from alcohol and it's available to you right now in a free training. And you'll also uncover the five myths of quitting drinking so you can stop doing that. Register in the show notes or on my website, marywagstaffcoach.com, and I'll see you there. who ended a 20-year relationship with alcohol without labels, counting days, or ever making excuses. In this podcast, we will explore my revolutionary approach to quitting alcohol that breaks all the rules, amazing stories from women who are throwing a better party because of it, and how you can stop drinking and start living. This show is not a substitute for rehabilitation, medical treatment, or advice, so please talk to a health professional if your alcohol consumption is a risk to your mental or physical health. Now on with the show. Welcome back, my beautiful listeners. It is week six. Congratulations, you made it through the 40 days of freedom from alcohol. I would love to know what your experience was. How were you able to show up to answer these questions? Where did you get stuck? What felt like way too much to look at. Um, So briefly, I just wanted to recap before we get on with the show today, which you guys are in for a really special treat. You're going to hear me coaching live. Um, One of my clients who has actually been through this process, she's on the other side of alcohol. She still shows up to face some challenges once in a while. We coach through it, we work through it, but we use this framework of the sacred service to the self. So these five weeks of this journey, as well as the essential five shifts that are kind of all interwoven into this to really take a practical look, but a really sacred look at this life and how we want to show up for it. So when we are faced with, you know, the challenges of being human and all of the stuff in the outer world, that we practice presence, that we, when we jump onto the super highway of the mind and get caught in these thought loops, we can very easily with compassion say, all right, girl, we can turn this around, right? And now we have the tools to do so. And then we have this framework. Once kind of, once you you start to get on to alcohol and alcohol is, you know, on the, you're on the other side of it, but maybe you're still having some triggers and you know you know how to pick those out, well, of course, there's going to be life that shows up. And so um, you use the same framework to meet those same problems. So you're in a pandemic, you're in quarantine, your kids are home from school. How can you use this confrontation of the problem or Um, you know, when you're trying to control a situation and you're faced with fear and then you try to control the other because you're feeling out of control, how can you shift into perspective? We talk about coming into the present moment using, um, I just sent an email out today about coming to your senses, like literally coming to your senses by stopping and checking in on your senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you, what, what is in the air? And this might seem, you know, kind of fruitile at first, but this is it. Where does the abundance of life live? It doesn't live in the past. It doesn't live in a memory. It doesn't exist in the past and it doesn't exist in the promise of a future. It exists now. Happiness is available to us in every moment. And even when we're feeling a not a great feeling, the ability to accept how we're feeling is available to us every moment. It puts us back in the driver's seat. So I had promised some listener Q&A. So I'm just going to read a couple um, questions and answer them to the best of my ability. They weren't really specifically about um, 
about the sacred journey of the self, but around alcohol and, uh, you know, emotions in general. And then we'll get on to listening to the live, um, the live coaching session with one of my clients who I'm just so grateful for. Um, and so we answered the call of the self, right? You know, you're listening because you know that alcohol is not the highest version of who you are. And as much as it might pain you to think about it right now, there really is a brighter future on the other side of alcohol. So you answered the call and then confronted the story without shame of saying, hey, I really want the best version of my life. And unapologetically, or at least right now, I'm going to confront the story of how alcohol is showing up for me and just be honest that it's not serving me anymore. It's not, it's not overfilling my cup. It's not making me, um, the brightest and best version of who I want to be in this world. So we confronted the story and then week three is claiming personal responsibility. So taking that really amazing opportunity to step out of a victim role and step into that place of the inner guru, taking responsibility for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions, and knowing that other people also need to take responsibility for theirs and that the circumstances of the world are not an opportunity to give up, right? They're an opportunity to respond with that new perspective and that new shift because we know two people can be in the exact same circumstance and handle it or have a completely different result based on their interpretation of it, based on their thoughts, how they think about it, their feelings and their actions. And, um, From that place, week four, we talked about your unflinching why, that anchor, that tether to why this matters at all, that deep, deep deep-seated place when you ask yourself why three times. So maybe initially it's like, I can't, you know, um, I'm, it's health for health reasons or, um, I'm, you know, ruining my relationship with my partner or, you know, I'm working out and I'm really conscious of my fitness regimen, but I can't keep losing, I can't lose these 10 pounds because, um, I keep drinking, whatever it is. If there's a surfaced why, then you ask why. So then like, why does that matter? Why is being in relation, a better partner? Why does that matter? Well, maybe because your relationship is, um, you know, what you value the most in, in your life. And then, well, why does that matter? Because it is how I'm seen and heard. And this is my tribe and this is my community. Well, why does that matter? And you just keep going deeper till you get to this really fundamental core seed of your unflinching why. And, um, and it could change and, you know, and if it is kind of surfaced at the beginning, you hang on to that. But when we dive deeper, into who we are and you know we look at the values assessment of the life intention then we can just you know when we're going to choose like oh a beer sounds good right now but why is that going to even be in service of of my highest self of the work that I want to do in the world and it's not to say every action that you take in the world needs to be this enlightened response to something but why not right? I mean, it doesn't have to be like a big dramatic action, but just not doing something can also be in service of how you want to show up in the world. And then when our cups are overflowing with self-love and gratitude and we get to love ourselves and know ourselves, then giving becomes like nothing. We just, we just show up. I know for me, when I'm not taking good mental care of my mental and in my mental health, when I get into a thought spiral or I am consuming things that aren't in service of my highest self, whether it's food or media, um, I want to, I have a tendency to just want to shut it all down and 
then I'm not in service to anyone. So I take care of my mental health. I stay in alignment with my truth, which means my movement practice, my connection with nature, um, my connection with self and some of the devotional tools that I love to use. I love to chant and meditate and pray. Um, and that's different for everyone, but find some of those sacred things that are important to you to keep coming back to that anchor, to that seed of why this matters. And then the fifth and final shift was showing up like everything's a miracle, right? You make the decision and then you just can't, you just don't go back. Either everything's a miracle or nothing is. And I'm suggesting that you choose that everything's a miracle because it's a wild, a wild, wild ride. We just watched um, the movie 2010. Um, if you haven't watched it, I would recommend watching both of them. It's like a like, you know, great cinema, um, cause it's when like film was actually film, um, and not digital, but, um, and it's, it's just a, it's a trip, but you know, it really is this expansiveness of like, wow, the universe, like I love to think about with like, I just let it brush over me, but I love to think about galaxies upon galaxies and the stars and the magnitude of existence and the universe. And then it makes, it takes me out of me being the center of my universe and that like, you know, wrapped up in this silly thought spiral that's not, has no va validity, um, without shame. <laughs> like I don't, I just laugh at it now. I don't like beat myself up. Right. I'm just like, oh my gosh, that was a tangent. Come back, come back to baseline, come back to your senses, wake up and smell the roses. Um, um, but I love to think about it because then it makes me feel like, yes, like this life is part of this really magical existence of mystery and wonder and awe. And we don't know what, but it, it kind of brings a little breath of fresh air when we don't look at just like our lives and humanity as like the center of all of it. When we can look at the symbiotic relationship of all of the world and the universe and and all of these things. And then, you know, our mora um, mortality doesn't become such a grave thing either. You know, we can, um, we can shift into a place of understanding consciousness at a bigger level and what all that means. But those are all big topics for maybe another, another episode. But you know, when you get out of these thought spirals and alcohol doesn't become the center of your life, then you do, you kind of live into a more expansive place where it's like, Ooh, what can, what can be joyful? What can be fun? What can be mysterious? Like I love to think about alchemy and making magic. And, you know, I made a bunch of, uh, red cedar, um, bundles for smudging this, this winter when I was <laughs> locked up in quarantine and just like invoking this essence of clearing my space frequently, um, to just make sure I was like stepping into a new mind framework every time I showed up to do the work or we were in the house a lot. So like things would get a little stagnant energy, like what's possible, what's out there, expand your mind. You're never too old to play. You're never too old to shift into a new framework of being. And you might not have to change anything. Maybe you just you know, turn some music on for dinner. I wrote an um, email this weekend. And if you're not on my email list, just go sign up for the five shifts um, on my website and you'll get on my email list. But it's like, set the table. Like don't, wine doesn't make dinner fancy. You make dinner fancy. You can have a great fancy dinner at quarantine. Turn on some music, light a candle, get dressed up for dinner. Use your dishes and your napkins. Like why not? What, what else? Like, what are you waiting for? Life is now. Life is now. This moment is the only moment. Eckhart Tolle, I just watched a little mini series of him. He is like, talks about the power of now and that it, it's all there is. You can't manifest a new reality, a future reality, um, of, a, of abundance. If you can, if you're in a place of suffering in the present moment, the future you you will take your mind with you. You have to be in able to accept and be not accept that you're like accepting the fate of, you know, where you're at, but the feelings you have to be in a place of seeing them and like, okay, this is where I'm at getting out of that thought spiral, removing yourself from a place of observation 
to then be able to free up some space for possibility. He said something about, and it might have been a teaching of Jesus, I think. I can't really remember. He talks a lot about a lot of different um, spiritual teachers, philosophies. If you don't know him, he's really awesome. Eckhart Tolle. Um, he, and it was something like, all you need to do is believe in your prayer for the better future. Like belief that it's better is going to get you way farther than the anxiety of the tragedy, right? And however it manifests, you're going to be in a better place in the moment anyway. So you might as well choose the best story instead of the shittiest story. I remember one of my first clients I coached, we talked a lot about that because she would create these future focused stories of like doom and terror. And it's like, well, if you're going to create a story for yourself, and this is just the human condition, we all do this, um, you know, create the best story. Okay. So on with the questions. Um, let me see. Okay. Here we go. Um, in a recent episode, you must, you mentioned confusing excitement and anxiety. Um, this really resonated with me as I know I have done this many times before. I anticipate that you would suggest applying the five shifts in these moments to really elicit true emotion behind the physical sensations. But I wonder if perhaps you could elaborate a bit more on the particular confusion. Um, perhaps you have an embodied practice around this as well. And this is such a great question and I hope that, um, (laughs) I'm answering it. So what I was saying is that the sensations of anxiety and, um, excitement can be similar and they elicit the same response in the brain. Um, it's that same association trigger, which is then to drink. And so, Um, The way I see it is that the emotions themselves can be like a combined nervous excitement. And so this would be about something like um, that you're giving a speech. And of course, you're not like, I don't want to do this. This sounds like terrible, but you're, you want to do it, but you're never done it. So you're excited or like taking a trip. You have that nervous excitement. Um, But then sometimes you're just, you know, you're straight up anxious because say like of a reoccurring thought about a test result that you're getting or say a a pandemic. Um, But either way, the sensations themselves can be very, very similar. Um, You know, increased heart rate, blood pressure, maybe sweating, like you're just feeling not grounded. Maybe your throat tightens up. They would be different for everyone. Um, So then that's producing the same results, um, response in the brain to seek alcohol, to avoid the pain or the lack of control about really is about the unknown. So we kind of have that anticipatory nervous excitement because of, because of the future of the unknown. And I just come back to the practice of presence. And if this is something that you're not used to, it seems, it can seem like what, that doesn't even make sense. Cause we're just, we just don't live in this way. We're just not taught it, but it's, it's very simple. Like you, I can do it right now while I'm talking, like you literally just tune into the environment that you're in. You, you literally come to your senses. You look and see what you see. What do you smell? What's the temperature like? You know, I can even like tune into the sound of my voice, um, the way that I'm sitting on the ground, the, the sensations of the earth below me. What does my body feel like? I have like a little itch from some bug bites. So you tune into the presence, right? And then you take a couple deep breaths. And this is the only way to come back to reality, to know what is true. Um, so we, we tune in to the senses and then we tune into the breath. So the breath controls um, the sympathetic nervous system, which is where we regulate a, a lot of things. Um, our blood pressure, our heart rate, digestion, And where we can tune into the parts of the mind that can create that more expansive process. So um, there's a four, two, four part breath. So where you inhale for the count of four, one, two, three, four, you would do it slowly. You hold for two and then you exhale for four. And so when you do this, say for two minutes, like a straight two minutes, you just tune into the breath, the responses of your body, because you're 
you're interrupting that thought loop and the responses of your body automatically shift. They automatically slow down. And you still might have like that kind of like like a little bit of like a wrenching in your tummy or maybe your heart is still fluttery. But what you've done instead of creating now the feeling thought feeling loop. So we have a thought that elicits a feeling and then that feeling elicits another thought, especially when we're anxious. You're like, oh my gosh, am I, you know, having a heart attack or, you know, especially with like COVID, all these weird symptoms. It's like, oh my gosh, my throat, is my throat closing up? Um, And it's just like, you know, allergies or something like that. So you shift, you break the thought loop. And then with that sensation now in the body, now you can just start to name it. Okay, what's happening in real time? I'm feeling a little bit of tightness in my chest. I'm staying relaxed in my breathing. What do I know to be true right now? Well, I do know I have a speech on Tuesday. Um, I'm prepared. I'm, you know, I, I really am excited about it. But in this moment right now, I'm going to trust that it is going to turn out amazing. I know a lot of the people in the audience. It's a supportive crowd. No matter what, I know I'm going to show up to do my best. And you stay. What do I know is true now, right? Um, And then you can shift what you're doing and like maybe go take a walk or something. So this is kind of what I'm talking about where excitement and anxiety um, can tend to invoke that same situation. And so if it's something like you're packing for a trip and you're, you know, having, I know I used to get excited about my vacations beforehand and start to drink beforehand. So you like are drinking and you're packing Um, And instead of that, you can simply take some moments to breathe and visualize how relaxing your trip is going to be, you know, all the awesome things you're going to do and just tell yourself like, oh, I'm so excited to be on the plane and traveling like without any anxiety or a hangover because that makes it way worse. I want to have memories. Um, I had this like really visceral experience this weekend where we went to a lake for kayaking and I had been there before like when Matthew and I first got together but I couldn't like grab it so this was probably like seven years ago and it was like there and I was like saw a part of this trail that we hiked and I was like oh I know I hiked that but and it was like it was like frustrating but at the same time it was so empowering to know that the reason I did not remember being at that experience and who was there and the whole thing was, yes, it was a long time ago, but I still have memories from that long ago. Is because of drinking. Alcohol completely killed my long-term memory. There's so many things that I've forgotten that I don't, like the last couple of years have been crystal clear. Like I couldn't remember his family being there. I was probably like drunk in front of them or, you know, who knows, whatever. But I was like, man, that sucks. (laughs) like not that memories are much of anything except they are the past but like to have that feeling to tune into a memory to remember a fun time gone and maybe it wasn't fun who knows we might have gotten into a fight I don't know (laughs) so that is my answer for that question um is to come to your senses um and then that, that could be different for everyone. The practices that I do every day, I do breath work. Um, I do kundalini yoga, which is a lot of breath work. It really draws, switches the um, patterning and the, the subconscious patterning in the brain without having to do like all the thought, like a lot of writing. It just, it kind of brings you back from that super highway quicker. Since I've been practicing kundalini, my my practice of presence is so much more potent. Um, I do yoga. I do different types of exercises. I've been trying to invoke more play with dance and just playing with my little boy and just being silly and goofy. Um, Sometimes I like to stare at the trees and the clouds, nature walks and being really present in in nature. Um, And journaling is writing, um, drinking tea. Whenever I drink tea, I really like to be present in that experience and think about the elements that went into it. And um, different than drinking my coffee, but my tea, I really slow down with. It's a ritual for me. So like a sacred ritual, setting the table, gardening, lighting a candle, all of these things are practices of presence, which is all we have. Um, 
And so really quickly, um, another question, the feeling of sun on my skin, music, and happy hour in the patio elicits such a feeling of freedom and euphoria. I don't know how to get anywhere else. Um, Is it wrong that I love this so much and I don't want to lose it? Uh, You're preaching to the choir (laughs) and you're preaching to so many choirs. This is something that I can relate to so much. I did, I've always done so much um, (laughs) outside of my normal life that literally everything that I've done, I um, associated with alcohol. And so the biggest thing that I can say to this is alcohol is a concentrated, it is not bad that you like this. No, it is a, and thank you for, thank you for the questions. It is, it is a concentrated reward. So the way that our brain naturally receives pleasure, say from like being on a boat in the lake with a sunset or playing with our children or, you know, getting up and dancing and being like a little goofy when we're getting that super high concentrated reward of alcohol, it is very challenging to get that same natural high from these natural activities, even alcohol and then like yoga, because alcohol is so strong and it gives us such a quick, immediate flood of dopamine that yes, you almost feel like you can't experience that euphoria anywhere else, but that euphoria is not real. It is produced by a chemical, a strong chemical. And so when you naturally um, use your body or things in your environment or activities and engagement with other people to get that, those, to those trigger, those chemical, those feel good pleasure responses. Um, you're not creating bad habits because you aren't bringing in an external, um, chemical to, to fill, to, for your mind to latch onto to create that habit so it just takes time and eventually that pathway won't be as worn down and you'll still love to be on the patio chit-chatting with your friends and you'll still love a warm summer sunny day with the music but you do it does take time for the chemicals in your brain um and the natural reward system to kind of i always say recalibrate um, and then for a couple of months at first, when you're first stopping, when you first stop drinking, um, the brain is almost like kind of like short circuiting and rewiring itself. So it's really important to like drink lots of water and detox and not, and exercise, like move your body so that you're not just like eating a bunch of sugar and like, you know, watching TV. It's really important to like shift those processes in a really positive, healthy way that are going to create new healthy pathways. So it's not like it replacing alcohol with exercise or something like that, but it's like we want the healthy, um, healthy chemicals, healthy floods of dopamine. You don't want to get, um, you know, addicted to sugar after your quitting alcohol. So all I can say to that is just know on a scientific level that yes, you are receiving this huge flood of dopamine. And so all of those things that you mentioned or that you love that are, they elicit that feeling, um, but they will still be pleasurable without the alcohol. You just need to give yourself time to remove that concentrated reward because you know that that concentrated reward still does not have the desired outcome that you want to see. So thank you so much. I hope that you had an amazing sacred journey. Enjoy this interview um, or this episode of live coaching. Um, we, it's, we don't really talk a lot about alcohol until the end, but you'll get the feel for what coaching feels like and how this framework really rolls into everything. And I'm just so grateful for my client. I'm so grateful for you guys. I hope that you're envisioning a new, beautiful, bright future of joy and peace and harmony in this world. Please stay in the, the, the joyful feelings and Um, I, it's really easy to go down the rabbit hole with everything that's going on, but no, if you do the sacred work for the self, you can be in sacred service of everyone and of this world and of this planet. And you don't feel like, you know, judgment kind of falls away and you can just be, um, be a beacon of light and love, um, and give selflessly 
to those who are coming into your sphere and then you reach out to do the, the work that you need to do and you just don't feel like it's so hard anymore. Alcohol takes so much time, so much of our energy, so much of our effort and our money and it's all energy, right? Time is money, is energy, is, you know, thoughts. It's all the same thing. Abundance is available to you right now in this moment. You are living an abundant life right now. Like the abundance of life is flowing through you. There, It doesn't get any more abundant than this moment. So just take a moment to feel that. What What is your definition of abundance of life? Well, a really deep breath, right? full blooming of trees and nature, seeing children play, seeing people get together to protest for their rights, for their freedoms, for one another. Like this is the abundance of life. So take it in, take care of yourself so you're functioning at optimal level. The mind, the spirit has its own um, defense mechanisms, right? Like when we take care of our physical body, this beautiful temple body, this vehicle that we get to move around in, we are also nurturing the spirit because it doesn't feel neglected. So just remember that the, that's why I talk about that curate your consumption. Taking care of the physical self is also taking care of your highest self, your emotional body, your spiritual body, When you, I mean, you can neglect yourself, but it's going to be really hard to reach in because it'll be really out of alignment. So have a beautiful day and I will talk to you soon. Reach out um, to sign up for a consultation. I would love to chat with you about where you're at, where you want to go and what, what thought is getting you stuck. It's a really fun time and I just love to get to meet my listeners. So have a wonderful day. Bye guys of unraveling your story outside of the confines of alcohol is truly a sacred and beautiful journey of the self. Rediscover who you are and a whole new world again. Stop by my website, marywagstaffcoach.com to get instant access to the on-demand workshop of my revolutionary five shifts approach. And while you're there, you can sign up for a one-on-one consultation where we will create together your life intention. This is the framework for which all of your decisions around alcohol are made from your truest and highest self. In addition to working remotely worldwide, I host private one-on-one healing retreats at my sanctuary in Mount Hood, Oregon.